my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. This episode is sponsored by Milkies by Fairhaven Health. Milkies is a line of thoughtfully designed products by moms for moms to help support all women in their breastfeeding journey. Products include breast milk collection and storage, supplements, teas, nursing pads, and much more. Milkies is generously offering 10% off all products with the code BIRTHHOUR at fairhavenhealth.com. And at the end of this episode, I'm so excited to be talking to Helen, who designed the Milky's Milk Saver, which is probably my favorite baby product of all time. Um, I used it with both my kids and it allows you to collect milk on one side while you're nursing on the other so all of those leaks don't go to waste. Anyways, I get really excited talking to her, so be sure to listen to the end for that. And they're also going to be doing a giveaway, so um, we'll talk about that at the end as well. Today's episode is with Grace Green, who's going to be sharing her hospital birth story. She had a natural birth and used Bradley Method classes and also had her sister as her L&D nurse, which is pretty cool. Hi, Grace. Thanks for coming on the birth hour today. You're welcome. It's great to be here. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yes, my name is Grace Green, and I live in Jackson, Mississippi with my husband, Mason, and our daughter, Nancy, who is almost four. I'm 31 weeks pregnant with baby girl number two. I also work as a birth doula, and I teach childbirth classes. Ooh, are you doing that right now while you're super pregnant? I am teaching classes. I had my last birth, my last doula client. Actually, baby was born on Valentine's Day, so Mm -hmm. last week. And that's kind of the last one. There's another doula friend of mine who I might help out, but she and I, our our due dates are really close, so we'll kind of see how that works out. Otherwise, I'm kind of taking a break, which is good just because of the lack of sleep and how much physical work it takes to do. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, it'll be fun to share your birth story while you're about to have another birth. I know. I know. I'm looking forward to it. Well, let's start off by talking about finding out you were pregnant and the type of birth that you were planning for. Yes. So my husband and I had tried for a couple months to get pregnant and we were actually on vacation with with our extended family. And I really thought I was pregnant. Just I was feeling just a little different and, you know, (laughs) just kind of, you know, just a little off. And so I um, mentioned to him, I was like, I think I might be pregnant. And he goes, well, let's wait another week to test just to make sure. And I was like, okay. So we waited another week. And in that week, I ran a lot at that time. And I remember thinking just running was miserable. I could barely pick my feet up. I could barely like run. I mean, I would think I had like worked so hard and I would have finished and hardly run at all. And it had been the slowest pace that I'd run in like a year or something. And I was like, I really hope I'm pregnant because if not, something else is going on. Like I just feel so off. So we waited a week and we tested and I was pregnant. And then after that, I started feeling morning sickness and stuff. But yeah, I had kind of always known I wanted a natural birth, an unmedicated birth. I didn't really know a lot of the reasons why. I just thought, well, you know, I should be able to do that. My mom had done it with me and I had a really good friend who lived out of state who had had home births and she was also a chiropractor, but then went and got her midwifery training and became a certified midwife. And so I just heard a lot about birth and stuff from her. You know, I just kind of knew I wanted an unmedicated birth, but I really didn't know where to start. Like I didn't know what resources there were, anything like that, and wasn't connected to anybody in the birth world other than my sister is actually a labor and delivery nurse at a local hospital. And one thing she told me that really stuck out to me is she said, Grace, you don't have to have pain medication, but you need to have some type of pain management plan. She's like, don't just come in here like unprepared thinking you can just kind of wing it and you don't know what to expect and you're not prepared in any way at all. And so I was like, okay, well, I need to be prepared. And then another friend of mine who's a, who is a coworker of my sister, who's a labor and delivery nurse, 
she posted a little infographic on Facebook that had C-section rates of local hospitals and my mouth almost hit the floor. Like I live in Mississippi and our C-section rate is kind of runs around like the third, we're like the third or fourth highest in the nation among the states. And the local hospitals in Jackson have very high C-section rates. And I was like, wow, this is terrible. And I knew one in a positive sense that I wanted an unmedicated birth, but I also knew I really wanted to avoid a C-section if that was possible. And so at that point, I realized, okay, I'm going to need to be very proactive about this. I can't just go into, you know, the situation expecting things to come out okay, because I think at that point, the hospital where I was delivering their C-section rate was It was close to 50%. And like that was from the year before or two years before that the stat was. Kudos to them. They've, it's lowered drastically in the last couple years at that hospital. But I um, realized, okay, I've really got to be proactive about this. And a number of different people just mentioned Bradley Method classes to me. And I had never heard of the Bradley Method. I looked kind of around and the closest class was um, an hour and a half away, one way. So it was three hours round trip. And I um, was talking to my sister about it. And she said, well, my coworker took these classes, the same coworker who had posted that information about the C-section rates. She goes, why don't you talk to her? So I talked to her and I was like, is it worth it to drive? Because Bradley classes are very comprehensive. They're 12 weeks long. And I was like, that's a lot of driving on a weeknight, you know, for 12 weeks in a row. She had done the same thing. And she said, it's worth doing it. Like, it's worth your time and your money. You'll learn a lot. And this is coming from a labor and delivery nurse who said she gained a lot to help her in her birth. So I thought, okay, so I called the instructor and talked to her and I was like, got really excited. I was like, I want to take these classes. And I posed it to my husband and I was like, I really want to take these classes. I've, you know, researched, I've looked at all these. The only thing is there in Hattiesburg, which is an hour and a half south of Jackson where we live. And he was like, Hattiesburg, why do we have to go to Hattiesburg to take these classes? And I was like, well, nobody teaches them in Jackson. And he's like, well, what do women in Jackson do? And I'm like, well, they do all these things that I don't want to do. They get like induced and have C-sections and have episiotomies. And I said, I don't want any of those things. And he said, okay. He said, well, you know about this more than I do. And you're the one who's pregnant and you're going to give birth. And so we'll just do it. Anyway, it ended up being really a fun time for us. It would just be kind of like a date night in the car. And on the way down here, I would read through the workbook and read through the, you know, handouts and whatever we were supposed to have read for class and read them to my husband. And then we would, on the way back, talk about things that we learned in class and, you know, kind of thinking about our birth and our plan and different things like that. And so it was just, it was a really good time. We just, we loved having that uninterrupted time together in the car. And we learned so much and felt very well prepared. It was completely worth all of the the time in the car to take the classes. And my friend who lives out of state, who was who's the midwife, she had also mentioned to me Hansi Goer's book, The Thinking Woman's Guide to a Better Birth. And I had actually started reading that ahead of taking Bradley classes. And when I got near the end, she was talking about doulas and labor support and the evidence for using a doula. And so I told my husband, I was like, I think I want to hire a doula. And so again, I didn't know anyone in the birth world in Jackson at all. Wasn't connected, you know, wasn't in a single Facebook group, wasn't in anything like this. But through my sister and this other friend of mine, who's a labor and delivery nurse, they gave me the name of a doula and I talked to her and just really hit it off. I was able to hire her and bring her on as onto our birth team. So things were great. I just kind of did everything to really educate myself about birth and pregnancy as much as I could. Yeah, I'm totally the same way. I feel like I read more about pregnancy and giving birth than I have like since about parenting for the rest of their lives. <laughs> yeah. But I was super prepared for that. So aside from spending most of your pregnancy just getting really prepared, did you have a pretty good pregnancy overall? I did, yeah. Other than like feeling really sick and tired my first trimester, just normal morning sickness. And I didn't throw up a lot. I just felt really bad. Past that, I felt really good. You know, there were no complications at all. I was very active. I was a runner before getting pregnant. And about halfway through, I decided this isn't fun anymore. (laughs) This doesn't feel good to run with this big belly. So I stopped running and just went to walking. And I would do, I would walk a lot, probably like about three miles a day is what I tried to do. Or else I would do um, spin class as well. And so I stayed really active. And I think that helped with my pregnancy and I, I loved being pregnant. And so I can't, I didn't have any complaints, you know, I wasn't, I know some people get to the end of their pregnancy and they just say, I was just so ready. I just, you know, did, was over being pregnant and I never felt that way. I was just loved 
loved it once I got to like week 13 and stopped <laughs> feeling bad. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get into the final weeks of pregnancy and just kind of some of those first signs that baby was coming. Yeah. Well, like I said, I felt so good. So it's not like I had like big signs. I fully expected to go past my due date. You know, I had read all this stuff about due dates and how they're inaccurate and that you go most first time moms go past their due date. And I had to learn that in Bradley class. And my um, mom, I was her first baby and she went 10 days past her due date with me. And one of my sisters had already had two kids and she had gone past her due dates with them. And so I was just fully prepared to go to 41 weeks. Like that's what I had in my brain. And well, okay, this is funny. My husband likes me to include this when I tell the birth story. So my due date was March 9th and our wedding anniversary was March 5th. We had moved when I was pregnant and there was a, there was a rat in our house and we could not get rid of it. And we didn't know where it was, whatever. And I finally was like, we're in this old house in this cool neighborhood, all this stuff. And I was finally told my husband, I was like, get an exterminator in here because I cannot bring a baby home with this like rat in the house. And, and he was, and we were laying in bed and this was like, so it's March 5th. My due date was March 9th. I might've gotten this date wrong. So it's March 5th. It was our anniversary. We were laying in bed and we we're going to sleep. And we heard something in the room and I was like, he was like, oh my goodness, the rat is in the room. And so, you know, this whole like Tom and Jerry cartoon scene ensued where my husband finally ended up like getting the rat, getting it out of the house, you know. So that was, and I was laying in bed like the whole time, like having contractions, just like, oh my goodness, what is going on? But my husband is absolutely convinced that at that point I was like, emotionally ready to have the baby because I was like the rat is gone out of the house and we have <laughs> this baby <laughs> so he um he's convinced that's what helped me go into labor and I, I you know I wasn't even I was still at this point thinking oh these are just Braxton Hicks I'm not gonna have the baby for a while so uh, <laughs> it's nice that yeah. he gets to take some credit <laughs> yes he does and it's so funny because I always forget that part and he's like you gotta tell him about the rat I think you're like I'd rather you not <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I think that's what puts you into labor I think he's really proud of himself for just catching it I mean, that's impressive. <laughs> and it's funny because we haven't had any kind of problems with like rodents or bugs or had to call a term exterminator for anything since then. So I don't know what it was. It was just this one had taken up residence. So maybe it was. Who knows? Now that I know so much more about the mind-body connection and labor, maybe my body was finally like, okay, now it's safe to bring a baby home. The next morning I, I got up and I lost my mucus plug and it came out, you know, just one giant piece all together. And I was like, holy moly, what is this? And I think I texted or called my sister, who's a labor and delivery nurse. And I was like, this just happened. And it's kind of real. And she's like, no, that's totally your mucus plug. Like, that's what it is. And I was like, okay. And I still was in my mind thinking, okay, I've got like another week or so. And I didn't even tell my doula. And now as a doula, I'm like, I would want to, I want to know these things if my clients are having these things going on. But I kind of knew, oh, you can lose your mucus plug and you can go like another week until you have your baby. But it was a sign that my body was getting warmed up. That afternoon, my sister came over to the house and she brought her two boys in the double stroller and we walked three miles as fast as I could, you know, 39 and a half weeks pregnant. And so we did that and I was just feeling normal and fine. And that night, my husband and I went to Bed Bath & Beyond to get some curtain rods to hang up curtains in the nursery. And I had almost finished sewing these curtains and I had this thought in my mind about like, nine o'clock at night, I could just stay up and finish these. Like I could, I could totally just sew these. It'd be fine. And then, you know, and just stay up a couple hours and I didn't have anything the next day. I'm like, I can just, you know, sleep in if I need to. And then this other voice came in and said, well, what if you go into labor? Wouldn't it be nice to have some sleep? And I was like, okay, I can just do it tomorrow. I'm not going to go into labor tonight, but whatever, I'll go to sleep. And that was really, really a good decision to not stay up and sew those curtains. So I went to bed that night and about... 2.15, so that would have been the morning of March 7th, and I was 39 and 5 that day. I woke up and was having contractions, and I had been woken up other nights with contractions, but I'd usually, you know, drink some water, go to the bathroom, and come back and just be able to go to sleep, and so I tried all that. I think I ate a granola bar, drank a bunch of water, went to the bathroom, and I just couldn't get comfortable, and I had to keep getting up and going to the bathroom, and I was like, at some point it hit me like these feel really different than the other contractions that I had. They weren't painful at that point, but they just felt like they were much more serious than before. You know, when I was trying, I was like, just go back to sleep, go back to sleep and trying to get comfortable in the bed. And I couldn't. And so I had my 
you know, contraction timer app on my phone. And I was like, let me just time these and see how close they are. So I started timing them and they were about um, two and a half to three minutes apart from the get-go. And I was like, oh, whoa, <laughs> like four or five in a row that were two and a half to three minutes apart. And I was like, wow, well, maybe this is labor. And so I think I got up and went to the bathroom again and then like was trying to get comfortable in the bed. And at some point in the process, my husband kind of woke up and stirred from me, you know, moving around so much and everything. I told him, I told him, I said, I think I'm in labor. I said, but go back to sleep. <laughs> Just go back to sleep because this could take a long time and I want you to be rested. And so he laid there for, you know, a minute or two and he was like, you know, and he could like tell I was having contractions and all this stuff. And he was like, okay, if you're really in labor, I cannot go to sleep. Like I let me, he said, let me get up and take a shower and kind of get things ready to go. And if it stops, I'll just go back to bed. And he said, if not, like, you know, we'll be ready to go. He said, I can't sleep right now. I think it just got his adrenaline going when I told him I thought I was in labor. I was having a hard time getting comfortable. So I went and got in the bathtub and asked my husband to give me some music that we had and, and get me some, give me a snack. And so I just was in the bathtub laboring. He got ready, he took a shower and he was doing all this stuff. And it became pretty clear that these weren't stopping. They were all probably the longest break I had between contractions was four, maybe five minutes, but most of them were closer to like two and a half to three minutes apart right from the beginning. They were getting more intense. And so he would go and get a bag and run it to the car and then run back. I think he got a great workout because I was like, get back here before the next contraction. So a contraction went in and he'd be like, okay, I have like a minute and a half to get to the car. And so he would like run as fast as he could and run back to be with me. At first I was like, this is very much, you know, this is hard, but it's doable. And, you know, we're making it through. And I felt really confident, like going into labor ahead of time, just from everything I have read, had read, I just thought I can do this. I've, I've read so much. I've learned so much. And it's interesting. One of the things of the Bradley method is they talk about the emotional signposts of labor. And as a doula, I can really see how it's most of the time, very accurate. So I followed straight along with that. Like first I was pretty excited. I was in labor. Then I got to like, this is hard. And I got more serious. I'm like, but I can do it. And then I got to like, this is really hard. Things were getting harder. And it had probably been, I had texted my mom and my sisters. I have three sisters. And one of my sisters is a labor and delivery nurse at the hospital where I was working. And she had said she would come in and be my nurse. And she was actually scheduled to work that day. So I had told her. And then we texted my doula. Initially, I said, I think I'm in labor. And then about an hour later, I'm like, I'm definitely in labor. Like, I'll keep you updated. Probably around 5.30, we decided to go to the hospital. Contractions have been two and a half to three minutes apart consistently. And then I threw up and I was getting shaky and all these things. And I was really having to vocalize through contractions. And something funny about that, I remember my doula telling me, you know, well, you might vocalize through contractions. It might feel really good. You'll make like a really low sound, like, and she made this sound. And to me, it sounded like a cow or an elk or something. And I was like, that is ridiculous. I am not going to sound like that. And that was exactly the sound that just started coming out of my mouth. And it was amazing, but it felt so good to make those deep, low moans, those birth sounds. And so we decided to go to the hospital and my mom was going to come over to the house. She lives really close. She lives about a half mile from us and she and I have a good relationship. And, you know, she's had five children and most of those were unmedicated births. So I knew she would be, you know, she wouldn't be freaked out or anything by how birth went. And so she was coming over to the house, but we decided to go. And I remember I was outside and Mason, had, my husband had run in to get something else. And I was leaned over the back of the car, just swaying my hips, moaning, you know, like an elk or something, just so loud outside. And she pulled up and she's probably like, what is she doing? Like, what is going on? Just, you know, it's still dark. I'm in the front yard, like doing this. And I was like, we're going to the hospital. So she, so we went on to the hospital and it was amazing from the beginning to the end, just how everything just worked out so amazingly. So first of all, we pulled up and we went, into, there's a back entrance into the hospital if it's after hours. So it was about 5.30, 5 45 and we pulled up and go inside and the security guard who's there you know 
I'm obviously in labor and he's like coming to try to help and like, let me call for a wheelchair. And he looks up and he goes, Mason? And <laughs> Mason goes, Chuck? And it was a real, it was somebody he knew. It was Mason's co-worker's husband. He just worked part-time some as this, as, I think he was a retired police officer or something. And he worked as a security guard nights in this thing. And so he knew him and he was like, oh, I'm going to take care of you. And so he like called up to labor and delivery, got a wheelchair right away, all this kind of stuff and had him come down. And so he went up to labor and delivery. And well, another funny thing, when we called, Mason called on the way to the hospital, I was like, call him and tell him we're coming. So he called labor and delivery. And it's about the time when women would come in for a scheduled induction or a uh, or a C-section. It was, you know, 5.30, 5.45 in the morning. And so he calls and he's like, I'm on my way with my wife. She's in labor, you know, all this stuff. And they're like, well, are you scheduled to come in? And he was like, scheduled? He goes, we're not scheduled for anything. He said, she's in labor. She's like, we're coming. And so we come in and they get us all set up and they get in a room and my sister wasn't there yet. She said she didn't see my text message initially. And then she saw it and she said she got ready in like five minutes and left and got to the hospital. But there was another nurse there who I didn't know. And I knew a lot of the nurses who worked there because my sister worked there, but um, I didn't know her. I don't know if she had a birth plan or whatever. And she was like, starting to tell me, you know, we'll do this and do this. And I need this from you. And, and I was like, I was like, hang on, I'm in labor. Like I have a birth plan. Like, please look over my birth plan and just, you know, (laughs) I can't do all those things right now. I'm having really intense contractions. I need you to just kind of be patient and accommodating. I think that kind of helped slow her down. She read my birth plan and we, you know, started kind of proceeding from there. And she said, well, let me check you. And she said, we're about, you know, you're, it looks like you're really in active labor. So we can kind of give the doctor an update on what's going on. I said, okay. And she checked me and I was only two to three centimeters. And I remember I wanted to cry at that point. I was like, what in the world is going on? I have been, I mean, it wasn't a long, long time, but I had been three and a half hours with contractions every two to three minutes. I had like, you know, been throwing up. I had, you know, was having to moan through contractions, all this stuff. And I was like, there is no way I'm not further progressed than this. And I was like, I I don't know that I can do this. At that point, I kind of, it was kind of a reality check. Like this is going to be a lot harder than I expected it to be. One good thing, I was 100% effaced, which meant my cervix was just, you know, paper thin and could quickly move out of, could easily move out of the way. But I was just like, this is, this is hard. And so we had told our doula, we were going to the hospital and asked her to meet us there. And at this point, I was like, I really need her. I said, Mason, text her and see where she is. And she said, he said, well, she said she's coming. I said, well, tell her to hurry up. Like, tell her I want her here right now. And I always remember that when, um, you know, dads call me or whatever, when their wife is in labor, I remember that. I'm like, you know, that feeling of like, I need her here right now. So I'm like, okay, I'll hurry and get there if I can. But he was like, she's coming. And it seemed like an eternity. It was probably like five minutes, you know, till she got there. And about the same time, my sister got there. So she kind of took over the care, the nursing care, which was awesome to have her as my labor and delivery nurse. Um, And then my doula came in and she was a very experienced doula. She'd been a doula probably 35 or 40 years before people were even calling it a doula. She had just started supporting women in labor. So I asked her, I said, they only said, I'm only two to three centimeters. Do I need to go home? I know that you know, you shouldn't stay in the hospital if you're this far along, if you're not very far progressed. And she had watched me for a few minutes or whatever. And she said, she said, I really think you're, you know, you're, you're very well established in active labor. I don't think we should go home. I think we should wait here for a little while. She said, just the way you're acting and the way your contractions are coming, I think, you know, labor is progressing. And now as a doula, I understand what she, what she was talking about. And she did say, she said, you seem like you're having a hard time relaxing. I think the whole rigmarole of getting into the hospital and getting there with the nurse I didn't know and, you know, who who wasn't the most helpful initially and all that had just kind of put me on edge. And then finding out I was two to three centimeters, just, I was just, I was like, I can't do this. And she said, she said, well, let's, you you look like you're having a hard time relaxing. She goes, how about we get in the bathtub? Or she said, would you like to get in the bathtub? And I said, yes, that would be amazing. They drew a bath for me. I got in the bathtub and that was just fantastic. It kind of brought me out of that panic state and ability to relax. And I really relaxed well, got into a really good pattern with contractions. She was helping talk me through contractions. My husband was there supporting me and the water just... 
I, I relax really, really well in water. Like if I feel sick or feel like anything's wrong, like I want to get in the bath or shower. So that was just very helpful to me to be able to get in the bath. It's just amazing to me kind of how our bodies know what to do in labor. Like I remember at one point she said, oh, that's fantastic movement. You're doing just great. You're going to work the baby down. And I didn't even know what I was doing. And I realized a contraction would start and I would just in the water just start like swaying my hips doing this like mermaid kind of movement. And it was just what my body was telling me to do to kind of help move the baby down. During that whole time, my sister would come. She was just, you know, would monitor the baby while I was in the tub. She just had a dop tone and it was, it was fantastic personalized care. She would come and take the baby's heart tones while I was in the tub. And I just labored really well for maybe two hours or so in the tub. And then, you know, decided to get out of the tub. So I got out of the tub, got dried off, was switched positions and did some different things in the room. And I kind of felt like, okay, we've regrouped. Things are okay. Um, this is really hard, but I'm, I can still deal with it. And around eight o'clock, my doctor came in and she said, let me just check you and see what's going on. This was maybe about two and a half hours after my initial check. When I was, they said I was two to three centimeters. It was probably about like 8.15. And she checked me and she said I was eight centimeters. And I remember I just was in disbelief. I couldn't believe it. Now I realize, looking back, you know, just being able to relax so, so well with the help of my doula and my sister and my husband and, and the being in the bathtub, even though I was only two to three centimeters, labor was, I was really in an active labor pattern and had been kind of since the beginning, since I'd woken up at 2.15, you know, contractions had been steadily like two to three minutes the whole time. I mean, my husband said he like started tearing up when the doctor said eight centimeters because he was like, this shoe's been working so hard. This has been really intense. Like it was like, I'm just, he was just so thankful. And I just thought, okay, maybe I can do this. Like if I've gotten eight centimeters. So I then just labored in different positions around the room on my knees over the back of the bed. My husband would actually sit on the birth ball. I, the, it didn't feel good for me to sit on the birth ball, but I remember I was like sit on the edge of the bed and kind of lean over him while my doula would um, rub my back and stuff. And so I just kind of got in different positions and did, you know, just kind of labored throughout the, in the room how I needed to. And um, I remember thinking it just kept getting like harder and harder. And I just kept thinking this is the hardest it can get. And then it would just get harder. There was another, another level beyond that. At one point, I was kind of leaned over the back of the bed, and I remember I was just, I was scared, and I was like, I think something is really wrong, (laughs) because I kept thinking, how can I be feeling what I'm feeling, and she has not come out of me yet? Like, like, what is it going to take for her to come out if this is what I'm feeling? And I said, I thought I was dying. I was sure. I I was like, mark me down as a casualty to childbirth. Like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be one of these people who just, who just, you know, I, I thought I wasn't going to make it. And I kept saying, I think something's wrong. I think something's wrong. Both my sister and my doula said, well, what's wrong? And I said, these contractions, I just can't deal with them. And they said, they said, well, nothing is wrong with you and the baby. You have been, you know, you are perfectly fine. The baby has done amazingly well through labor. Everything is okay. And I thought, okay, that kind of brought me back down a little bit. I thought, well, if I'm not dying, let's do this and make it through labor. And I was over the back of the bed and I remember just praying and just asking God to give me the strength to get through this. Cause I said, I'm really scared. This really hurts. I was just praying out loud. And I was like, and I need, I need your strength to get through this. And then my sister said, let me check you again. I don't know if I was acting like I was pushy or what. And so she, but she checked me again and she said I was nine and a half centimeters with a bulging bag. So of course, you know, that's more encouragement that I'm so close and, you know, can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. And then I really started feeling an urge to push. And I was sitting kind of on the edge of the bed. They lowered the bottom of the bed down and I was leaned over my husband, like he was on the birth ball and I had my arms around his neck. And um, I said, I think I need to push some. And my doula said, well, you can bear down some if you need to. You can bear down during contractions. So for like a couple contractions, I would just bore down really hard. And then my bag of waters broke everywhere. Like as I was pushing, I mean, it was like one of those dramatic movie scenes everywhere. My husband like jumps out of the way. It goes everywhere. I'd been feeling the urge to push from the pressure from the bag of waters. And it was, I mean, like the nurses were like, we need more towels, bring in more towels. It was just everywhere. And so 
they they were cleaning it up and initially I was like oh that feels so much better just to, from the pressure from the bag of water so it was broken it wasn't there and that felt good for about two contractions and then it was like whoa like that's kind of where I really hit transition because I didn't have the cushion in the bag of waters and it wasn't truly second stage yet and it was just it was just really hard at that point point. and I remember my sister said I, had, I was nine and a half centimeters and I just had a little anterior lip of cervix and so my doula suggested going to sit on the toilet to try to help get that last little bit of cervix and just open up and, you know, before it was time to push to kind of finish out labor. And so I was sitting on the t- backwards on the toilet. My husband was up by my head. I told him I needed him there. My doula was sitting behind me. She was on the birth ball and she was working some kind of magic on my back and my hips. I'm not sure what she was doing. My sister said, I don't remember this, but my sister said, I kept saying to her in labor, I love you, Carol Ann. I love you. And because she was just really, really so helpful and amazing. And I remember I was sitting backwards on the toilet and I told my husband, I said, I just need you to pray for me for it through every contraction, pray out loud so I can hear you for me to get through this. And I just had tears running down my face. And I was like, this is just so much more than I signed up for so much more than I ever thought I could do. My sister said, let me check you again. And I don't know if I was like started to bear down or what it was, but she, while I was sitting backwards on the toilet, was able to to check me. I kind of leaned back into my doula's lap. I was like, I can't get up. I can't move. I leaned back into my doula's lap and my husband stood behind her so the birth ball wouldn't roll out from under her. And she checked me and she goes, I don't feel any cervix at all. You can push whenever you feel like you need to push. And that was just the best (laughs) words I had heard, you know, maybe in my whole life up to that point. I was so thankful and so excited. And, um, and then it was really interesting. I know that some women don't like pushing, but a lot of women do. And I really did like pushing. And it was like, I had been in this hard transition stage, all this was going on. And then all of a sudden it was like, like, you just flipped a switch? And I was like, okay, I'm ready to push. Let's go have this baby. And it was like, I came back kind of a little bit out of labor land into my right mind more. And I was like, I want to go have this baby. I tried pushing in some different positions. I tried using a squat bar and I didn't really like to squat. I thought I would, but it didn't feel good to me. The position I ended up in was kind of seated in the bed, like had the bed kind of in an upright position and then had some help holding my legs back. And that that felt the best to me. And it was interesting because I would like, at that point was able to talk during, you know, talk in between contractions. My sister was like, it was almost like you're back to your normal self. And then I'd be like, oh, here comes a contraction. You don't get my legs. I got to push. And so I'd push and I pushed for maybe about an hour and a half. And so, so, you know, they had like, they called in, you know, the birth team and how they do at the hospital with everybody who comes in. And I remember them saying, you're getting close. We can see your daughter's head, probably four or five more contractions and you'll, you'll have her out. At that point, I was like, I am just done. I'm over this. And I looked up at my husband and I said, the next contraction, I'm pushing her out. And as a doula now, I know that's a really bad idea. (laughs) You want to slow down at the end and you want to just give your body time to stretch and accommodate the baby's head coming through. But I was just ready to be done. And so I pushed as hard as I could the next contraction. And she came out like all, almost all at once, like head and then like her whole body just kind of, she, she came out very quickly at this point. And I was so relieved. I was so thankful. It was the best feeling in the whole entire world. You know, I remember, and this is so funny, the doctor, he, he like pulls her up and hands her to me. And the very first thing I say is, I didn't die. <laughs> and my doctor just started laughing. She goes, no, you didn't die. I wasn't going to let you die. And so I was just, I mean, cause I guess I really thought that it was a, true possibility at points in labor. I was just so thankful, so relieved, and just all those wonderful birth, after birth hormones that you hear about, just the oxytocin and the endorphins and adrenaline and everything. I had all of them. I remember just feeling like I was just felt so good. And then, um, and you know, and I had been so tired near the end of labor and it was just amazing how much better I felt and just the relief of having her out and just being able to hold her. And we, you know, just, we all cried. We were so thankful for her and she pinked up real quick and she was crying immediately and just, you know, I was able to hold her and breastfeed her. And then, 
um, we were able to do um, delayed cord clamping. And it's so funny because you kind of get in a time warp during birth after the baby comes and you kind of don't know what's going on. And my doctor said, um, said, okay, we can cut the cord now. Dad, do you want to cut the cord? And he had been on such high alert that we're doing delayed cord clamping. Don't let anybody touch the cord ahead of time. And he goes, we're doing delayed cord clamping. And he was just like, you know, don't do this. And she goes, she goes, we've waited a really long time. She goes, there's nothing left in that cord. And I think it had been probably 10 minutes or more. And I mean, when you look at the pictures, there's nothing. The cord is totally white. So, um, but I was proud of him. I was like, you took your job seriously and you remembered to remind him not to cut the cord too soon. And then I probably was able to have her there with me. It was probably like over an hour and we just had skin to skin and the breastfeeding and you know, my mom was there and then another one of my sisters came in after she was born and my mother-in-law. And I know that probably like that many people might stress some folks out, but I'm real close to all of them and was feeling so good. I was like, let's uh, everybody come in. Let's just, you know, show this baby off to everybody. And after about an hour, decided to get up and go to the bathroom and walk to the bathroom. And it was just so nice to be able to just get up and walk, you know, after just immediately afterwards. And so my sister helped me. And then they weighed my daughter and she was eight pounds, seven ounces, and we were able to hold her more and just have some time together. And um, so it was just, it was just great. Oh, and some, this is funny too. When I was in transition, I remember I said a couple times, this is, my husband always likes to say this part of the, of the birth story. At one point I said, Dr. Bradley is a liar. He is a liar. Because I remember thinking of these classes and at one point he said, you know, think of it as more hard work than it is painful. And I was like, no, this is painful. This is not just hard work. And then I said, all those women who say natural birth is great, they're lying. Everyone lied to me. <laughs> Everyone lied. And he was just like, and now, and I've heard other doula clients say that to me since. And now I realize, okay, when all those people are saying that, you know, when Anime writes these birth stories and has these books and all these things, they're all writing it after the fact with all of the hormones when they feel amazing, not in the middle of a contraction. I was like, I'm sure if you asked them in the middle of a contraction and transition what they were feeling, they, it would probably be a little bit different story. Because afterwards I was like, this was wonderful and everyone needs to do this because of the way I felt and just, um, you know, how everything went just so smoothly as I wanted to. Only thing, I did have a pretty significant tear just because I pushed her out so fast because I just, I accomplished my goal of getting her out in the next contraction, but I did have a pretty big tear, but thankfully it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal to recover from. And otherwise everything went fine and I just felt so good afterwards and so thankful and just, you know, thankful to God for helping me get through it and my whole support team. I just needed a lot of support, but they were there with me. Such an empowering story, and I love that you shared some of the little anecdotes that were kind of funny that we sometimes forget about from our birth stories. Yeah, and it's funny because my, my husband said when I was talking about how everybody had lied to me, and I just felt – he said I was trying so hard not to laugh. He's like, this is not the time to laugh. But he was like, it was just so funny. And he was like, um, he was, and, um, but he, thankfully, in his, he was able to not laugh. Now looking back, it was, I mean, it was fast. It didn't feel fast at the time. I had her at 11.44 and I woke up at 2.15 in the morning. So it was only nine and a half hours, which for a first baby is really fast. Mm -hmm. And I think that might've con contributed to the intensity of it because it was just, we just packed a whole lot into a short amount of time. But yeah, everything went great. And I was just really, really thankful for the experience, really thankful for how supportive everyone was to have my sister as my nurse. I mean, that's just incredible. I mean, who gets to have that? And she just, you know, would follow me around and let me do kind of whatever I needed to do and just get the heart tones when she needed to with the dot tone. And it was really a, a positive experience, a very empowering experience. After that, like I remember they had to give me a shot postpartum for something. And the nurse was like, it was, it was a different nurse than my sister. And she goes, it's going to be a really big stick. And I was like, you can't hurt me. Do you know how to stick? <laughs> I'm like, go ahead and stick me. Like, see what you can do. And it was, but she was like afraid, it, you know, warning me of this big stick needle stick and I was like I was like nothing you can't do anything at all to hurt me um just you know um after what I what just happened so that is awesome I love that 
Well, you mentioned a lot of resources throughout your story, but was there anything that you didn't get to mention that you want to recommend? Another book that I read that I really was thankful for was The Womanly Art of Breastfeeding. My Bradley teacher, had, she had highly suggested that we read that ahead of time and that we attend a La Leche League meeting before having our baby. And getting connected with those resources was really helpful. Like the book emphasized a lot of the things that I wanted to do in birth to be able to start breastfeeding off on a positive note. And then just building the support team ahead of time from being connected to our local La Leche League and having gone to meetings while I was pregnant and just having that support system in place. Those were really, really helpful. I also watched, I know a lot of women have mentioned this before, but I watched The Business of Being Born. That was a homework assignment from our Bradley teacher. And that was really, really eye-opening to me and just even more confirmed that I wanted to birth a certain way. And so that was really helpful. Um, and Hansi Gower's book, The Thinking Woman's Guide to a Better Birth. And of course, the Bradley classes, they were fantastic and very helpful to me. Thank you for all of those. And I'll link to them from the show notes page so people can find them easily. And did you want to share where listeners can connect with you online? Sure. Yeah, I have with my my birth website is called Grace and Birthing and graceandbirthing.com. And then on Instagram, my Instagram name is Grace B. Green. There's an E at the end of green. Yeah, you can just find me there, either, either of those places. I am going to take a break from some doula clients after having this baby just to be able to have a good, solid um, postpartum recovery and have time with the baby. But I plan to start teaching classes again, you know, a couple months after I have the baby and everything. So Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story, Grace. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed getting to share it. Head over to thebirthhour.com to find the resources that Grace mentions. And now we're going to talk to Helen, the inventor of the Milky's Milk Saver, one of my absolute favorite baby products. Hi, Helen. Thanks for coming on the birth hour today to talk about Milky's. Thank you so much for having me. Can you give listeners just a little bit of background on who you are and a little bit about your family? I am a nurse. I live in Oregon. I have three kids. I have two boys that are nine and 11, and I have a daughter who's four, and I'm married to Brian Anderson, and he's a firefighter paramedic for the city of Portland. So you guys are just a little bit busy over there. <laughs> <laughs> we are busy. My boys started playing hockey this year. So that's uh, that's a lot of driving because there's not a rink close to our house. We've had many, many snow days this winter, and my husband actually kind of created a rink. So that's been a little bit nice that I can just kind of kick him out of the house and they can go skating in the driveway. But uh <laughs> That's not typical for us. That sounds pretty magical. Yeah, it is pretty fun. All right. So you are the inventor of the Milk Saver from Milkies, which is honestly one of my favorite baby products. I recommend it to all of my friends that are having children. So I'm so excited to hear about, you know, how this product came about. Well, thanks so much for saying that. It's really a passion of mine. Um, I think anytime you kind of bring a product into the market, especially since Milk Saver was my very first thing that I ever developed or really got behind, I am just really excited to hear how it's kind of had a positive impact in your life and also other moms. So um, that's really exciting for me to hear that that you like the product. Um, I still, after all these years, it's been out since 2008, it never loses its impact on me that people appreciate the product and that moms are using it. And um, it's really making their lives easier. That just makes my day. So tell me about how you got the idea for it and what it is. Well, the Milk Saver collects milk from the non-nursing side during a breastfeeding session. And that may seem super confusing to a lot of women that haven't breastfed or don't leak. But for me, when my baby breastfed, my oldest son, Colton, who's 11 now, when he breastfed from my right breast, my left breast would just pour out milk and I would soak a pad easily every time I nursed him. And I remember using my single-sided pump um, because with my first kiddo, I just sent my husband to the Walmart and said, get me a pump, you know? And so he just chose one off the shelf and he just got me a single-sided little cheapo pump and so when I would pump at night with my single-sided pump, I would balance a bottle on my other leg, like under my breast. And so I would drip two ounces into that bottle when I pumped. And so I kind of put that idea into my head that 
this happens when I'm breastfeeding too, that I'm leaking two ounces. So I just thought I need to find a way to collect this milk while I'm breastfeeding. You know, with my first, I kind of did the bottle thing, which he would kick over and there would be milk everywhere. So I would not only not have the milk saved, but now I have a mess to clean up. So, you know, that wasn't the ideal thing to do. Um, I would also talk to other moms that I worked with about what did they do? Did they leak so much? And a lot of moms said, yeah, I had the same problem. I remember someone asked me about, hey, how's motherhood? And I said, well, you know, my breasts make more mess than my baby. And that being really my impression of how much I was leaking. Yeah, I definitely had that. You had the same situation? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had so much leaking and I would just like I would fold a diaper pre-fold into like quarters and shove it in my bra and um, it it would soak through. So I was like, I knew how much milk I was wasting. And when I found the milk saver, I was like, this is amazing (laughs) because I was able to fill my entire freezer full of milk from only the milk saver. Like I never used a pump with my daughter. It was incredible. That's amazing. And I've had lactation consultants tell me they've had moms that have done the same. They have, you know, a hundred ounces or 200 ounces just from using the milk saver. So that's, that's incredible to me. And I'm, that's so awesome to hear that. But I had a similar experience where I would just like, if I was home, right, I'm not going out, I would fold it like a dish towel and just put it in the front of my bra, (laughs) you know, and I'd have this uniboob that I would walk around the house with, but you know, I'm walking around the house. It doesn't matter. But because I get so tired of changing my pads all the time that I would be just wanting something that would last longer than a pad. So, you know, I just fold a giant towel (laughs) and put it in my bra. So it sounds like you probably had the same sort of uniboob situation going on, maybe. Yeah, it was not, (laughs) it was not cute. It was not fun. (laughs) So with my second, I really wanted to save that extra milk and, I looked for a product and there was nothing out there that could help me save that milk and stay dry. And so I was at a place in my life where I thought I wanted to try to start a company and develop a new product. So, you know, this is the very abridged version because it took me a long time. But, you know, that's how the Milk Saver came about. It really was something that solved the problem for me. And I found there was nothing, there was no solution out there that, that could do what I thought it needed to do. So that's why we came up with it. Well, since this is a podcast, people can't see it, but we're going to share pictures on obviously on social media and the website. But just to kind of describe it, it's really flat and just kind of fits into your nursing bra or tank. I even used it out and about like in restaurants and stuff because I just preferred, especially in the early weeks when I was making so much milk, I just preferred it so much to soaking through pads. So Mm -hmm. I would sneak it in in a restaurant and then I would dump the milk into like a water cup or something because I wasn't like trying to save it when I was out and about. But it's pretty, pretty discreet and which is kind of impressive considering it holds it holds like two ounces, right? It holds two ounces and we just made it a little bit smaller. We redesigned it because the feedback we got from moms was that they wanted a little bit smaller. They wanted a lid on it. So we did that. We this year we redesigned it and, and really came up with a product based on the comments that we've been getting over the last eight years. Ooh, how does the lid work? Because I guess that didn't exist when I got it. Yeah, the lid's pretty cool. We wanted to put a lid on it, of course, but we didn't want it to be an extra piece for moms or something that people had to manage or deal with that could get lost, for example. So the lid actually has a dual purpose which is of course to keep the milk in place, but also to keep the milk saver open. So the previous versions had a different kind of a hard piece that fit inside that would keep your bra from compressing the milk saver. But now the lid is part of that piece. So it's really cool. Um, Our goal is always to think about at two o'clock in the morning when I'm breastfeeding my baby, how do I make this as easy to use as possible? I don't want pieces that are gonna be washed or need to get, you know, need to be washed or pieces that are going to get lost. So when we redesigned it, we kept that theme of, you know, keep it simple, keep it easy to use. And so the lid has the dual purpose. Okay, that's amazing, because that would be my only one 
issue with it was I would forget it was in and I would yes. lean over and completely soak everything. Yeah. So that's awesome. Would you be able to use it like kind of sideline nursing too with the lid? I still would say you might get a little bit of leakage if you did it that way because the lid doesn't like screw on or snap in place. It fits right. snugly into there. So I don't know. I, I would still say use it in an upright position if you can. If you're laying on the side, you could turn it to the side if you wanted to. That's a good point. Yeah. Very cool. Well, um, I know we're spending a lot of time on the Milk Saver because I'm obsessed with it, but I know there's <laughs> other products from Milkies as well. So can you kind of highlight some of those and how those came about? Sure. So the cool thing about Milkies now is that we have other mom inventors that have these really great products that now are on our team, which is really fun and amazing. And another great product that we have is called the Milk Tray. And this was invented by a firefighter paramedic. Her name's Toby Porter, and she's one of my best friends. She's wonderful. And so she worked 24-hour shifts. She would be gone from 8 a.m. one day to the next 8 a.m. So her husband had to have enough milk to feed her daughter for 24 hours. And she found that she was spending so much money on breast milk storage bags. And not only that, but he would overthaw the amount of milk that he needed. And then at the end of the her 24 hour shift, there would be milk that would be thrown away. So you know that once you thaw out breast milk, you can't refreeze it. And so she would find that there were times when her husband would thaw too much and then that milk wouldn't be needed and it would be thrown away. So she wanted to make a system where each bottle was custom made for what the baby needed right then. So her milk trays freeze the milk into one ounce sticks. And then her husband or her mom or whoever's taking care of the baby just pulls out the number of sticks they need for that bottle. So instead of thawing out six ounces in a storage bag, they're going to thaw out three ounces or four ounces. Just grab that many sticks out and thaw that for the bottle. So it eliminates waste. And plus, it's super environmentally friendly because you freeze the milk in the tray and then take the sticks out and then store the sticks in a freezer safe Ziploc bag. We can store, you know, 30 or 40 ounces in a Ziploc bag if they're in the stick shape and then um, wash and reuse the tray. So we're not throwing away things using disposable products. It's really environmentally friendly, but it's super easy to do too. They're a great product and another invented by another, another mom. Very cool. And a good uh, compliment to the milk saver. It is because with the Milk Saver, we're talking about maximizing the amount of breast milk you collect and store. And here we're talking about a really great way to store a lot of breast milk. And storing each kind of batch from your Milk Saver into a separate little thing is ideal too because I know I would kind of have like a bag going in the fridge and add to mm -hmm. it and you're not really mm -hmm. supposed to do that with the warm milk to the cold milk. So this is a good way to keep people in line. <laughs> That's right because you don't want to lower the temperature of your milk over and over like as you as you're pouring in the warm milk to the already chilled milk then that'll lower the temperature of the milk and could cause bacteria growth so if you are accumulating milk you want to chill it first and then add it to your accumulated milk so you'd have to have two containers going at the same time mm -hmm. just for safety but just i'd throw that in right. <laughs> Right. Well, thank you so much for sharing everything with us. And um, people can go to fairhavenhealth.com, which has a lot of products, but um, the whole Milky's line to check those out as well. Right. Yes, that would be great. And definitely check out our Milky's line on mymilkies.com. I write a blog there as well. So um, you can check that out. And if you have any comments or you have any ideas for topics, I'd love to hear about it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today, Helen. Thanks, Ren. I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much again to Helen for coming on to talk about the Milk Saver by Milkies and to Fairhaven Health for sponsoring this episode. You can head over to their website, fairhavenhealth.com, and use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR, all one word and capitals, to get 10% off any of their products. And if you are expecting or have a friend who is, the Milky's Milk Saver is definitely the best baby shower gift or gift that you can get yourself. Um, it makes such a huge difference. So I highly recommend that everyone go and get one of those um, over on fairhavenhealth.com. And we're also going to be doing a giveaway 
on Instagram where we're giving away a Milky's milk saver as well as the collection um, milk tray. So be sure to head over to the birth hour Instagram account to check that out. You can connect with me over there on Instagram or also on Facebook and Twitter at the birth hour. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com to sign up for our newsletter. And if you really like the show, please subscribe and leave a review in iTunes. I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer, and you've been listening to another episode of The Birth Hour. Thanks again.